Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is February uh, 17th, and we are in part two of our interview with Colby and Kimmy Reddish. Is that right? Did I get the names right? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, and we are, we just got done with an epic three and a half hour interview where Colby and Kimmy talk about, uh, you know, being raised as faithful Mormons, getting married in the temple, having kids and, uh, living in Idaho. Um, Colby's an attorney and finding out that their Mormon Bishop, uh, was, a, a abuser, a sexual abuser of children. And so they told this epic story of the bishop getting released, of, of discovering uh, what the reason was that he was released because it wasn't uh, announced, and having to deal with a ward and a stake and a church that seemed to want to quiet it, hide it, and and not uh, do everything it could to protect the children, and, um, and honestly, uh, to kind of uh, support the victims. And it's a really important episode. We know that this is a systemic problem in the church. And uh, we know that this has happened thousands and tens of thousands of times within the Mormon church. And so we think it's a groundbreaking and important episode um, to help the Mormon church learn to handle abuse cases better. So go check out part one if you haven't already checked it out. Uh, we decided to go ahead and do a part two, which is kind of like how this experience uh, and how the way the church mishandled it then impacted their own faith journey. And so that's what part two is going to be about. It's literally going to be one hour long because I have to leave in one hour. And so we're going to cover their faith journey as a result of this now. And uh, I am excited to announce that we have a special guest co-host with us today. It is Jen Camp. Hey, Jen, welcome. Hi, Hi everybody. <laughs> So Kara Burrell is sick, and so she had to run home and sleep and get better. And uh, Jen is our newest employee of the Open Stories Foundation. She is a kind of office manager, uh, uh, operations director, and events manager for us. And so, Jen, it's just so lovely to have you. And she fills in for Kara when needed. When so needed. So look at you. You're filling in. Yes, Um yeah, I hope I'm one one millionth times as good as Kara. I'll try not to be horrible. Yeah, <laughs> but no. Kara is amazing. So. Yeah, well, it's so great to have you. Thanks for covering. All right, so Colby and Cami, you've you've told us about how you had some cracks developing in your faith prior to all this stuff coming out, but then some big cracks started uh, emerging when this whole sexual abuse scandal with your bishop emerged. But you also just told us it was kind of like a little bit of a mind blower. You have been attending your Idaho ward up until three weeks ago. So you are still members of record, as far as I know, and you you know, you, you're still kind of active in a sense. But now let's just spend an hour talking about the aftermath and how all this stuff has led to other explorations and discoveries and then where that leaves you. And part of the point is Mormon Church, if you mishandle sexual abuse scandals more and more, it's going to affect your membership. It's going to affect a lot more than just the uh, victims in, involved. It's going to affect people and, and church church activity rates and attrition. So let's just hear, uh, where do you guys want to begin kind of your own faith journeys as a result of this abuse? Well, I think the point of you know, our first three and a half hours is that it took a lot for us to realize that we had deal breakers for the church. There were certain things the church would could do that would make us go, wait a second, that is not what Christ's church would do. That's not the way Christ's church would act. That's really the awakening we had as a result of that situation. The very next thing we did was we started to look around at the damage that the church had done to other people. Cammie and I had talked for years about how the culture of the church, specifically about its sexual messaging um, and purity culture and its messaging to LGBT individuals was unacceptable. And we didn't think that there was a legitimate place, that the church hadn't created a legitimate place for for those brothers and sisters 
of ours. And we had even had the conversation, which kind of blows my mind now that we didn't realize what that meant, that if one of our kids had come out as LGBT, that we would leave the church in solidarity with them if the church hadn't changed and been more healthy and created a legitimate space for those people. So really the next step, I guess, or the next part of the story is we, because of the child sex abuse scandal in our area, we had started listening to podcasts uh, featuring Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife about how to talk to your kids about sex. And as I was listening to one of those podcasts, she referenced Matt Easton and the church's messaging on LGBT issues and Elder Holland's talk from August, was it 2020? I think August 2020 at BYU. No, it was, it was 2021. 2021. It was, it was, ha- that was happening at the same time because I remember seeing ward members um, in our area change their Facebook status to I stand with Holland. And I didn't know what it meant because I, I wasn't aware of Holland's talk and the news, but listening to that podcast, which we had both listened to, we listened to the same podcast. Was this the first podcast, then, Mormon theme podcast you had ever listened to? No, we, we'd been listening to Finlay and Fife for a while. But the first, yeah, um, the first Mormon stories episode. I but, listened to Faith Matters. So you were listening to Faithful Mormon yeah, podcast yeah. prior yeah. to just a few months ago, basically? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This would have been in September. So that's how close. Yeah. That's when so we were started. noticing that. And I think when Colby heard that, he. That's six months ago. It's yeah. six months ago. Yeah. Yep. So, so yeah, as of I, six months ago, even though you had been through all this sexual abuse scandal, you were still listening to faithful Mormon podcasts and, and yeah. probably unaware of the, a lot of the problems with the church history. And yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say I was unaware. I like my best friend growing up, um, no longer believes. And I had read the CES letter when he wanted to discuss it, like back on its original release. And I was, I think, like I said, my background kind of led me to believe in a more deistic God than most Mormons did. And so I found a space basically to say, well, I just don't think God works the way most Mormons teach, but I still believe in a lot of what Mormonism teaches. I know it's kind of like a weird place, but I wasn't a member who felt like, well, I can answer every question that the CS litter raises. I just kind of was aware of some of the issues and kind of acknowledged, well, I don't have answers to all of the questions, but for right now, the church is good for me. It's good for my family. And so we continued believing, even if we didn't have full knowledge of some of the historical problems of the church, but That day, um, when I was encouraged to, or I felt like I was almost like prompted to go listen to Matt Easton's original commencement speech. And then I went and listened to Elder Holland's talk, which really bothered me. I felt like even his tone really bothered me. Um, I thought, you know, a person like him using his authority to slam an individual who I thought came off as very genuine, like Matt, was really inappropriate. And then I guess thank the YouTube algorithm, but the very next thing that was recommended was Matt Easton's Mormon Stories interview. Yay, so that was thank you, YouTube. So that was the very next thing I listened to. And Matt was so genuine and heartfelt and sincere thanks to him. Like he and I have exchanged a few texts back and forth. And I think the big thing that listening to Matt's story brought me was recognition that. I kind of understood the church did damage to people in the abstract. And I more or less, and I'm ashamed to say it, looked the other way because it was good for me and good for my family and good for my life. And I'm not exaggerating when I say listening to Matt's entire story brought me to tears for a while in my office. I was actually at work and I just sobbed because of the complicity I felt with the way that the church was damaging people like Matt and couldn't even give the reason. That's the thing that really frustrates me about the LGBT situation and our brothers and sisters who are in that space is the church makes no legitimate place for them, but can't even give a reason. And there's part of me that wants to say to the brethren, if you are who you claim to be, get your 15 people together in a room and start praying and figuring out some answers to these questions. Like, tell us why 
you hear it so often. We can't allow people to be in open LGBT relationships because it frustrates God's purposes or whatever, but they can never tell you why or how. Or what that even means. Or what that like, means. That, that doesn't really make any sense to just say, well, it's it's frustrating the plan. And I I feel the same as you that I, he sent that that podcast to me. He's like, listen to this, then listen to this, and then listen to this podcast that has Matt Easton on it. And I did. So we both listened to it separately in the same day. I was at home with the kids and he's at work and we come home and we just, we just start talking. How did we not know? How did we not see the damage that the church does in this whole other area? Like we had just experienced how the church responded to sexual abuse of children. And then you just like, look over and see, wait a minute, this isn't the only place that the church is causing harm to other people. This church that we go to and that we pay our tithing to and that we put our kids in the classes of, this church that we make a huge part of our lives is causing harm to other people. We have to do something about that. And I think that just, that was heartbreaking to me to hear a real person's story of what it was like to grow up in the church and then start to see, oh yeah, I see how that damaged them. I see how that hurt them. And I believed those things too. I just wasn't aware of anyone personally. So I didn't understand how great that damage was. And I think from there, we started to listen to Mormon stories. We started to think about the implications of even just the things that we teach our own kids, right? About who God is and what role he plays in your life. And the fact that we had in fact prayed to find keys before and things like that. I started to think this, this can't be the right way. This might not actually be a safe, healthy place for us to raise our kids. But at the same time, you feel the weight of but this is our home. This is who we are. How can we make sense of these things? How can we understand these things? And, and so we started to study. I thought I need to know, I need to know the truth of these things so that I can make sense of them. So I can defend the truth and make this a better, healthier place for my family. Can I just say <clears throat> that, isn't it amazing the tunnel vision we have as Mormons while the church is working for us? that you know the church we could have an lgbtq suicide epidemic not to mention that you know there's the depression and the anxiety and just the bigotry towards lgbt people and then there's like a literal suicide epidemic where like our suicide rates in the in utah can be two or three times the national average and we're either oblivious to it as active mormons or just callous to it or just dismiss it or don't even care because the church is working for us or the church can be super racist and teach that dark skin is a curse. But if we're white and the church is working for us, we kind of just, Oh, that's in the book of Mormon, but let's just read past it. Or the fact that women, half of all the women in the church are second, uh, literally half of the members of the church are second class citizens. But if the church is working for us, we're completely blind and insensitive to that. Not to mention all the historical problems. Like it, it, it it's, not, not to shame anyone, but it's just a real testament to the undue influence of the church or of high demand religions that until you have some earth shattering event that sensitizes you, a kid dies by suicide, a loved one comes out as gay, you literally have to deal with the bishop that's sexually abusing children. That's sometimes what it takes. And even for most Mormons who have been through the things you've been through, it doesn't even phase them. Yeah. It's kind of mind blowing. When I was discussing this whole situation with a family member and basically telling them that I couldn't believe anymore, they asked me a question that I think was really telling. They said, well, I know that you've told me stories about people who've been negatively affected by the church, but that wasn't your experience. So why does that, like, why does that change your opinion? And I think, for people who look around and see the damage that they see for many people around us, the church can be a meat grinder of human damage and, and collateral damage. It's like compassion. Like you can't, 
once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it does make me really sad. Like I said, John, that's why I felt so complicit and felt so sad because that damage was being done, whether I saw it or not. And that's why I would just encourage all members. Like I, I make space in my heart and in, um, in following Christ's path for members who know about the church's historical problems and issues if they're informed and if they speak up and yeah. say no more damage, like no more damage, yeah. especially with no explanation. That's the thing that just gets me so bad about LGBT specifically is the brethren can't even give an explanation of why it frustrates God's purposes. Yeah. And, and as you, as you look at, I don't know, as you look at everything in which I hadn't done and I don't, I don't understand why I didn't, feel the need to look at the church in a different way. I, I don't know what it, I don't know what it is. I had researched in their box so many times. I just never thought I was being lied to. I believed everything I was told. And I was told you do not need to look anywhere else, but then what we've told you. And I believed that and I stayed there and I researched there. But now that I see like this, this harm is being done. I mean, Matt Easton has spoken out now and there's been there's been no apology from Elder Holland. There's been no responsibility taken. There's been no, there's been, I mean, in no way can I say now that I want my kids looking up to Elder Holland as someone of how to act. Like he's not showing us the right way to act if we want to act like Jesus Christ. He's not showing us that. And I love Holland. He said beautiful things before. He's charismatic. Right? Right. And not only that, like I, I do think some of the things that he says are good and beautiful and he says some good things. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing is I was so willing to hold on to those things. And as soon as I saw it, like I said, as soon as I saw what he had done to Matt Easton and there's no way he doesn't know what he had done. He, he did not apologize for that. I can't get behind that. I can't get behind that that person who is saying, yeah, I have caused some damage. I have caused some harm here. And I don't care what defense you want to say, if he was speaking as a man or what it is, but that deserves an apology. When you hurt somebody, you apologize. Even if you didn't mean to, even if you didn't mean it the way that you said it, you apologize when you do something wrong like that and when you cause harm like that. And the more that I think about it, the more that I, I look into the things that we do teach something like polygamy and how women get really hurt and upset sometimes about how they just don't know what's coming after this life. If they're sealed to more than one man or what that looks like. And we say, no, that's okay. That's okay. God loves you. And it's all going to work out in this next life. It's all going to work out. We don't have all the answers here. And we can say that about one thing, but then we take the LGBTQ community and we see that it's causing damage and we see that it's causing hurt to people. And we decide that God doesn't want them to have the same blessings as the regular members. God doesn't want them to have the, the same blessings as Colby and I who are straight and we can just go into the temple because of that, that it doesn't make any sense that sometimes we say, you know what? I know polygamy is messy, so we don't have all the answers and we know God loves us. Why couldn't they just say the same exact thing about the LGBTQ community and say, we know God loves us. We know it's Christ like to love everybody. So even if there were some crazy reason that God wouldn't accept a temple marriage for an LGBTQ person, we're going to let God deal with that because we know that he cares about us and our happiness, but we're actively teaching the opposite. We're actively teaching that he wants us to discriminate against those people, that he's telling our prophets and apostles that we should not allow them to participate like other members. And I just, I don't know why I didn't see that. I don't know why I didn't understand, but now that I see it, I don't know if I can support that. I can't support a church that is doing that. And it seems like they're cherry picking some random things to do that with. And that that's hard for me to understand. And I think one of the things I'd point out too, is that that bigotry isn't born into kids. Um, we went, we teach um, it, we teach it. 
And I, we saw that really starkly. We went on a vacation with uh, old college roommates and friends and one of the people's in an LGBT relationship and they came with their partner and our daughter who's six um, said, you know, because these are two boys, they couldn't have a baby together. Right. And I said, yeah. And she said, so they'd have to adopt. And I was like, yeah, if they wanted to have kids. And she said, well, then can I go and help them like pick out the baby that they want? <laughs> and, you know, she's just a kid asking honest questions. And I was just looking at a kid like that of her age of six. She doesn't see any illegitimacy in that relationship no. in any way. She, yeah. they, she they was were like, oh, there's, they, they still get the family. Can I, can I help them? <laughs> like, I, I think she thought it would be fun to go. I don't know if she thinks it's a baby store or what it is that you go to when you adopt a child, but to see her just accept, oh yeah, that makes sense. It wasn't like something's gone wrong, you know? And I, I, if we let her stay, she will be told that something has gone wrong there, that something is wrong with that relationship. And I don't, I don't know why I, again, I, I can't explain to you why I wasn't seeing, seeing these things because they were all around me. It is what I've been taught my entire life. And maybe that's why it, it just is what it was for me and my experience. I'm kind of crystallizing what we're saying here. And part of the perniciousness of Mormonism is it doesn't just teach bigotry. It doesn't just teach bigotry to children. It teaches children that God supports bigotry. And that's just a whole nother level of uh, evil, I guess. I don't know. Or harm. If you don't want to yeah. say evil, harm. Yeah, it is. And it's it goes back to what we said in our first interview about oftentimes to save the image of the church, to save the good name of the church, apologists or people who make excuses for the bad actions of the church actually denigrate God. They put those things on God. And the way you put it is perfect because our very next concern. Uh, so then we had four historical concerns that we really studied. And the first was race and the priesthood. And um, we'll just say this of these. So we had race and the priesthood, polygamy, the book of Abraham, and the historicity and DNA on the book of Mormon. And we'll kind of be brief on these. Um, but the I'll go big, through each one. We well, the, well, the big thing I want to say about race and the priesthood, because what Cammie and I did, our primary study was the gospel topics essays and the footnotes that the church used to support its contentions. One of the things that really bothered me about the race and the priesthood essay is it does not fully come clean or explain. And I actually bought uh, Matt Harris's book on the gospel topics essay series after watching his interview. Um, and that really showed me how, the church does not fully come clean on the race and the priesthood issue. It basically tries two different explanations. It says, one, you know, yes, the church was racist, but everyone else was racist too. We weren't that far behind the times, which, you know, as an attorney who also has a fondness for history, that's just not accurate historically. If you look at the way that the world or the Supreme Court has recognized the legitimacy of you know, of minorities in this country, the church was well beyond the times. It was teaching as late as 1982, as far as I could find. Spencer W. Kimball was teaching that interracial marriage was a sin and bad, yet the Supreme Court had, you know, forbidden um, invalidating those marriages in 1967. They started integration in 1954, yet the Mormon church you know, withheld the priesthood and temple blessings. That's the other part that really irritates me is I don't feel like most members understand that it wasn't just priesthood. A lot of the common apologetic explanations, kind of like even Brad Wilcox did, is, well, it's God priesthood, God's priesthood. He could do what he wants with it. But what about the temple blessings? What about people like, um, is it Jane Manning James, who wasn't even allowed to go into the temple and receive her own blessings after being faithful for her basically for her entire life. And then when she does get to go in, she's sealed by proxy as a servant. Things like that are horrifying. The way that the church treated minorities is wrong. And the thing that really irritates me about the gospel topics essay is it makes it sound like the brethren did not teach these things as doctrine. And they absolutely did teach it as doctrine. If people haven't read yet, 
the exchange between Larry Nelson, I think that's in 1949, and the first presidency. I know it was George Albert Smith was the president of the church at the time. You have to read that exchange and recognize that the brethren taught so openly that God instituted basically this racism and that it was God sanctioned and that the prophets weren't going to separate it. And that is just so, like you said, John, that's so wrong. It's putting the bigotry on God. And the Gospel Topics essay, I think, lets those past leaders of the church off the hook far too much by saying that it was just policy and procedure. I think the last thing I'd say is when we've talked about this issue in particular with people, there are people who've told us the same thing, like, well, we need to have more leaders or more charity for the leaders of the church, including the past leaders of the church. It was a different time. And I just want to say to that like explanation, I am just plumb out of charity for people who damaged other people. Like if I have charity for people now, if I look back in history and I'm trying to use my charity, my heart goes out to the African American and other right racial minorities who were damaged and told they were less than because of these brethren's decisions that they were teaching as doctrine. That's who my heart goes out to. I'm kind of sick of using charity for the leaders as an explanation and a salve for just bad behavior. I, I care much more about, you know, the average member of the church than feeling like I'm maligning Brigham Young's reputation by labeling him what I think he just clearly was, which is a racist. Yeah. Yeah. And we're in the show notes. We'll include the Larry Nelson exchanges. We'll include the Mormon church first presidency statement. Right. Affirming that the, the priesthood ban on people of African descent, Mormons of African descent was doctrine. I think there were at least two first presidency right. declarations to that effect. And we'll include the, the gospel topics essay which is the worst of all, the least informative and least helpful of all. And one of those one of those statements was made in 1969. I think that's really important. So this idea that the Gospel Topics essay offers, which is like, yeah, we were racist, but so was everyone else. Like we had the Equal Rights Amendment, we had Supreme Court cases moving rights forward, as you know, the Equal Rights Amendment was in 1964, or the I'm sorry, the Civil, Civil rights, rights Act in 1964. Yeah. So the world is. 14 years ahead of the prophets and apostles. So this idea that the church wasn't exclusively racist, one, I don't think that's a good explanation anyways, but even if you believe that, the church was far beyond the times. The world was doing much better, in other words, of moving rights forward for people. Yeah, I think, too, as we were studying these things, um, I wanted to, under I started studying like I were, researching a paper for college. It's, it's such a different way to study. I wanted the sources. I, I mean, we even wrote the quotes in here, but putting them in the show notes is even better. So people can kind of go and no, you can, see you can for send themselves. them, send us any resources you want. But, we'll include a bunch of resources from them in our show notes to help you learn and fact check for yourself. Cause we're not asking you just to believe us. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing is I, I would go to these these quotes from, from church history and start to understand the timelines are off, the things that I've been told are off. Because the narrative that I was told growing up, the narrative that I was told to teach people on my mission is that the church would have crumbled if it had gone forward with anti-racism too soon, right? It was this weird, like, they really wanted not to discriminate. They didn't want to hurt the black people. They didn't want to be this way, but God had to not let them do it yet because the other people around them who were really racist would have, you know, taken out the church. And I, it doesn't make, it, first of all, that's just not true. That, that's just not true. I feel like I lied to people saying that, right? I feel like that was, that was not a truthful statement. And the other thing is that's still what the church is teaching today. If you research, and here's what I went to a lot of the times to kind of understand what the church's stance on it is that Saints Unscripted videos. Um, they've got some, I mean, they've moved past uh, Kwaku and things like that. But they, they have some on there that are, they are lying to you. I read the actual documents and then I watch that five minute clip that they do about race in the priesthood. And they're saying the same things that I was told to tell missionaries. 
First, they say this was not doctrine. They're very specific about that. When I just learned that it was doctrine, my mind was blown when it was doctrine. But again, if you choose to only research within the church, you're going to come across these messages like, these people don't know what they're talking about. It wasn't doctrine. When that's just not true. And that's what's so frustrating to me is I was starting to see I was being deceived. I was actively being deceived. It's no longer even about the information that I didn't know. It's about the fact that they were actually trying to keep me from getting this information and they were feeding me false information so that I wouldn't ever look for the real information. And I just, that, like, I just sunk. I don't, I don't know what to do with that. That's what makes me feel like I can't stay in this system. If they were honest with me and just said, hey, we found these quotes from the past. We're not really sure what to do with them. Let's kind of figure this out together, figure out how we've evolved, make this a good, healthy, transparent place to be. I would say, yes, that's a place I can get behind. I might be able to raise my kids here if we all come together and just try and figure out this messy past. But I found out the messy past has been hidden from me and that I've been told to teach people things that are not true. And that that is hard. I I wish that I hadn't told some of these people some of the things I told. Our mission came out with this packet that they gave to all the missionaries called the Resolving Concerns Packet. So it says Arizona Tumpa Mission. You still have it? I do. Yeah. I'd like a copy of that. It's it's in the car. Um <laughs> and so and and it has every point. It it was called we would call it the anti-Mormon concerns packet. So it goes through every single point and gives us missionaries a way to explain. And I remember in there exact and I've told people this. It says this line under race and the priesthood is the church was actively for the equal rights movement. They civil were rights. So oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, the civil rights movement. So they were for it. And now that I'm finding all of these quotes that they were act still today, they're actively against equal rights. It makes me just cringe. I want to call these people and say, I am so sorry. I lied to you about these things. I was given this information as a young missionary with no, no resources. I mean, I didn't have a smartphone as a missionary. I was a missionary in 2010. We had those little flip phones. I, I only had about five books I was allowed to read um, I, I wasn't even able to go outside and research these things for myself. This is just what I was handed. I was just given these things and told this is what the truth is on these topics. Anyone who says anything different is an anti-Mormon and trying to tell you things that aren't true. And that shaped me in a way that I took forward into my teachings in the church and being an MTC teacher and all these things. That's what gave me that arrogance, I think, of thinking I could answer all the questions is because I had answers. They gave me answers to all the questions. And when I go back now and look at those things with the real quotes and the Joseph Smith papers available to me, I realize that I was told, I was told to lie to people without knowing it. And that is really, that's a hard pill to swallow for me. I, I wish that I hadn't done that. Um, but I didn't know, I didn't know any different. I mean, what you just illustrated is uh, what we often refer to as Stephen Hassan's bite model, B-I-T-E, mm -hmm. high demand religions or cults. They control your behavior. That's the B. And in this case, they'll say things like, don't read anti-Mormon literature. Don't associate with apostates. Don't associate with people we excommunicated. Don't speak to people who have left the church. Don't, you know, stay away from social media. Stay away from the internet. Stay away from podcasts. So they're trying to control your behavior. That's the B, because they need to control the information that you take in. That's the I, information. Because if you learned all the stuff, all the truth about the church, you would probably have made very different decisions. Yeah. But, but And so they have to limit the information. And they limit the information both by literally telling you not to read it, but also by creating deceptive apologetics that protect you from being more curious or feeling like there's any need to dig deeper. Because if you have someone in trust saying, oh, well, there were just so many women <clears throat> on the planes and the men, the women outnumbered men so much that 
that the Lord needed the women to be taken care of. And so he called them to be polygamists because the women needed men to help them. You know, once a trusted apologist tells you that, you're like, well, I don't need to read about polygamy anymore because I already know the answer. So that that's how they control the information through telling you not to read it and through, through, uh, through dishonest apologetics. And that's why we tend to be a little bit hard on apologists here on Mormon stories because they're part of undue influence, honestly. And they, they control the information so that you won't ever have the thought, huh? I wonder if there's, you know, a problem here. I wonder if I need to learn more. I wonder if the church maybe isn't true. That's the thoughts that they don't want you to have. So they control the information. And then of course they use emotion to coerce you and manipulate you and control you to make you feel like you need them and you can't be happy without them. And they make you feel afraid if you leave them. That's the bite model. And uh, you just illustrated it perfectly. Well, and I, I love that you highlighted apologists because one of the things that I think is really important to our journey is as we were reading the gospel topics essays, and then we might read, say, a more critical view. Of, we might read a more critical book. I really enjoyed like Grant Palmer's um, Insider's View of Mormon Origins. As we'd read stuff like that, I would then go to Fair Mormon or whatever they're called today, or we'd watch those Saints Unscripted videos, and so many of their explanations were just so bonkers to me that I, I can't even understand how I guess I, I can. I can understand how people who want to believe find reasons to continue believing when they go to those explanations. But if you actually look at them critically for even one second, some of them make absolutely no sense. Well, it doesn't make sense that those responses were based on the same set of facts, right? If you just look at all the facts and then you look at the Saints Unscripted video it doesn't make sense that their answer was based on all those facts. They, they just pick one thing from here and there, or their favorite thing to do is just be like, there are so many ways to explain this. Let me tell you. And none of the ways actually make sense. None of the ways actually, they're just talking at you. But honestly, if I had watched that as a believing member, I would have said, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I just wish you had Jim Bennett on and I will say to his credit, at least Jim Bennett was honest. I, I feel like he was very honest about his beliefs. My ask, not that any apologists are going to listen to me or the but, church or the church, but my ask to apologists, I guess it's more to people who listen to apologists is you need to realize that while they'll speak at their fair Mormon conference, like They've reviewed the evidence just like critics, and they have come to a different objective conclusion. That is the biggest lie apologists tell, period. They are not objective. I mean, John Gee and Carrie Muhlenstein, I've listened to them a bunch because Book of Abraham was one I put hundreds of hours of research into, literally. Wow. And they openly acknowledge, they start with the conclusion that the church is true and that everything it teaches is true and work backwards from there and make the evidence fit. I feel like all traditional apologists do the exact same thing, even if they won't admit it. They are trying to find any reason to believe. And you just need to know that if you're reading them. They're not objectively reviewing information like someone who's more critical, like a Dan Vogel or someone who's like an actual, I feel like an actual scholar might. Um, so race and the priesthood, we talked about polygamy was our next big one. Um, I would just say the church and Brian Hales say of polygamy that it was needed to come back, that it was part of that it was part of the restitution of all things, and that Joseph taught that. Um, I think the big thing with me, and I dove into that resolving concerns packet. I remember studying it on my mission, and then I dove into the scriptures. So I started reading every scripture I could find on polygamy. I thought if there's an answer, I'm going to get it, and. I looked at every single one that mentioned polygamy and found no place that polygamy was commanded in the past. Nothing. I, and that's what I had been taught. That was the story. Um, God had commanded this in the past. And then Joseph Smith was commanded to restore all things to now. And so I was, it was based off of something that was not true. It was not commanded in the past. And so 
reading those scriptures for myself and seeing that they took this scripture that mentions polygamy in it because it was a custom of the time. And when God says, Hey, if you're polygamous, please treat your wives the same. It would say things like that. Um, it would mention people with multiple wives and ask them to, you know, be nice to them. Um, it never once said, you know, Abraham or so I command you to take all of these wives and this comes from me. Um, it was so clear to me that it was never commanded. And so the reason that Joseph Smith brought it back now doesn't make sense. And then second, when you look at the timeline of polygamy, which I had never done, I had always heard like what you were talking about, that the, the women needed the men at the time. A lot of the men had died coming over from the plains. Um, they were just trying to take care of them. I had never heard the stories of the flaming sword um, asking him to practice polygamy. I didn't know he had lied about it his whole life. I didn't know that he had started practicing polygamy without telling his wife. I didn't know that when he started practicing polygamy, he didn't even have the sealing power yet, that polygamy actually wasn't commanded until after he had started polygamy. And all of those things just meshed together into something that is so different than what I had been taught my entire life about why it is that our people have been asked to do this thing. It started to feel again, just deceptive rather than having any sense of understanding about this issue. I, I came back very confused about why all of this information had been kept from me my whole entire life. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next two for us were book of Abraham and the book of Mormon viewing the book of Mormon as a literal historical document. And I think, one of the things I was really struck by as I researched both the book of Abraham and the book of Mormon's historicity was if you go to actual history and you look at what we know about ancient Americans, or you look at what we know about ancient Egyptians, it is so offensive to me now that Joseph took other people's stories. So I watched the interview with Dr. Robert Rittner, all 15 hours of it. And one of the things I was really struck by was that the book of Abraham, um, I think he, he talked about this, how the priest who had commissioned that um, book of breathings likely had to work his entire life to save up enough money to have those papers drawn up. That was how important that was to him. That was his devotion to his belief system. And that then Joseph takes it, turns it into something it's not at all, and so to believe in Mormonism, you basically have to erase other people's legitimate history. And the same thing happens with the Book of Mormon. We know that Joseph, in my opinion at least, was going off of the mound builder myth and that he, I think, wrote the Book of Mormon to try and explain where he thought the Native Americans came from. But if you look at the Book of Mormon I think the thing to me that's far troubly, far more troubling about the Book of Mormon rather than anachronisms is actually the things that if it was a legitimate historical record based on what we know about Native Americans should be there but aren't. One of the ones that struck me just even this week as I was thinking about it is bears. Like if Nephi and Lehi and their family came over to America where there are no bears, so they started in Jerusalem where there are no bears, and they come to America where bears were part of a staple ancient American, Native American diet. It is so unbelievable to me that you can encounter a creature that's the size of a man or bigger, covered in fur, and never mention it. It's not mentioned in the Book of Mormon ever, a bear. Corn is barely mentioned, yet it was a staple of most of the agrarian people who lived here in ancient America, as was cacao if we look to more Central and South America. It just is completely inconsistent with real history. Another theme that I noticed was also turkeys, like, like turkeys, turkeys, jaguars, <laughs> things like that, that should be mentioned. And that's to say nothing of the 2 million people that are recorded in the book of ether as having died that nobody can find. Right. The other thing that really struck me was the themes of the book of Mormon. So captain Moroni and his 
big treatise between him and Pehorin about liberty and freedom, those ideas are so far from an ancient Semitic ideal, but who do they line up with? Like an, an early American settler who cared a lot about American or, origins and had this idea of American exceptionalism all floating around in his head, right? Like this idea of fighting for freedom and democracy that's built into the Book of Mormon narrative, it, it's inconsistent with viewing it as an ancient Hebrew text, in my opinion. And I think those are really the issues that we studied in depth. We went line by line through every gospel topic essay, through every resource, and we'll provide more of that because we don't want people to believe us. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing I would say is going through this, one of the things I want to share is one night, um, the night I really felt like I came to the conclusion that I knew the church wasn't fully what it claims to be. I remember going to Cami, and we know that people – leave their spouses over one of the the spouses not believing anymore. And I remember going to Cami and saying, I don't think the church is true anymore. And it's it was really hard for me to even get those words out. And one of the blessings, I think, of this faith crisis or faith journey was Cami saying, well, we'll study and we'll figure this out together and just fully loving and accepting me. I've said to her and to a few of our friends, like that was something from her that I didn't even know that I needed, but that I did need because I felt like, and it's just because of how amazing she is. I felt less than in some way in our marriage because of the church. Um, our mission president came to our ceiling and after the ceremony, I'm not kidding. This is a real story. He came up to us and told my wife right in front of me that if I didn't walk up to my priesthood commitments, she should, she had too much potential to not leave me if that's what I did. Um, and so Cammie just fully accepting me and working through this with me and us coming out on the same page, which is that the church is on what it claims to be. And um, that just meant so much. In many of the same ways I felt led to go on a mission or do other things in the church, I felt led in every instance by God here, like through this faith journey, I think that's probably where we would just end is um, what we believe today is like we don't believe in the church's truth claims after the research. We do believe in God still. We choose to believe in Christ is the way we say it. We believe that um, even if Christ, even if the record we have of Christ isn't fully accurate, say he wasn't really the son of God, that the message we have recorded in the New Testament is a good message to base your life around. We have really view it as his primary message was to love other people and to help other people help reduce suffering. And really anything that conflicts with that, we just kind of reject. Um, that's kind of where this ended up leading us. I think when it came down to it, to feel so deceived by what you trust and what you love and where your family is, I can't imagine anyone believing that we would just want to walk away from this. Like, we feel like we don't have a choice at this point. There is not a way back after learning this information. You can't go back. I mean, we tried. The month of January, we took seriously. We said we are going to go and we are going to see if this could still be our home. And what we found is that the church was still going to continue to teach the same things that we had been taught our whole life and that those things are not true. Those things are not true the truth of what happened. Those things are not the truth of how to be Christ-like. And so we're now having to navigate how to separate ourselves from the church. And the saddest part of all of this is that what Brad Wilcox was talking about last week, what he was saying, as harsh as it came across, like he is speaking Which for thing? the church. Which thing? 
the fact that he's saying that if you leave, you lose everything, right? He, he kind of went on a rant about it saying, give up this, give up that. If you walk away from this, there's nothing left for you. And I, I believe that because I feel like I'm losing everything. I have been taught my whole life that the church is all or nothing. It has been the way it is. It's just, it's all or nothing. And so I am now having to try and convince myself that it's okay if I take Christ with me. It's okay if I take God with me. But they have taught me that I should never, ever believe that, that I should never come to some place where I can think I can walk away without the good stuff. I know that there's good things about the church. I know that there's good people in the church. The church functions because of the regular members like us who do their part in making it a good place. But what I didn't know is that I needed to be more aware of even just the current church news. I needed to be more aware of what was going on. I needed to think harder about the implications of what we're teaching in church and what we're teaching our children. And I didn't do that. I I wish I had done it earlier. But now that I see, and now that I see that it's causing harm, and the institution of the church does not want to change their harmful ways, I don't feel like I can stay there. I, I, I do feel like it is not a choice I'm making. I feel like I am being pushed out of my family. I, be, I feel like I'm being pushed out of my home and I feel paralyzed in the sense that I don't, I, I know I can't go back. I know I can't go back to the believing place, the safe, having all the answers that I was in, but I also don't know. I don't know how to move forward from this. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how to separate myself from the church. And so what you were saying about the bite model makes so much more sense to me now that I am having to pry those pieces apart in my own brain because I am telling myself that I don't deserve happiness outside of this. And I know that that's not true. I know that that's not true, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that I'm not in that battle right now in my own head. It doesn't mean that I'm not having the thoughts over and over again that you are ruining your children, even though I can see that I would be if I kept them here in this space. And so I guess that's that's the struggle moving forward is how, how to find peace outside of this because I know that we deserve it and I know that it is truly our own relationship with God that is guiding us out. It's our It's our own integrity that is saying you can no longer stay here because if you stay, you will lose that integrity. You have to leave. And so I guess moving forward, it's just trying to figure out what that, what that looks like, how that, how that's going to be for our family and everything. It's so beautiful. It's so powerful. And I just have to take a moment to kind of call this out that high demand religions or cults, number one, there's no, there's no credible reason to leave a high demand religion or a cult. There's no way to do it with your dignity intact. Thomas McConkey relative to Bruce R. McConkie once told me a cult is any organization that won't let you leave with your dignity intact. And, um, and when we talk about the bite model and the E, the emotion, they need you to feel like you will lose everything if you leave. They need you to worry that you'll lose potentially your marriage, your your parents, the love and esteem of your parents, the relationship with your siblings, potentially with your children, with your neighbors and your family and friends. They need you to feel that fear of the consequences because that's what keeps so many people in. And so they need you to feel that way. And Brad Wilcox in the church need you to feel like you won't be able to uh, stay faithful in your marriage. You won't be able to be a moral person. You won't be able to have the light in your eyes. You'll have a darkened countenance. Your kids will become, you know, uh, drug dealers and sex workers. Like they need all that so that you stay terrified and don't ever leave. 
And then in some case, they want you feeling terrible if you do leave, uh, which I don't know that it's intentional, but that's just how these organizations end up working. And well, then there's such a punishment there. I, we did an interview just this week from a trusted source, a member of a stake high council mm -hmm. who reported that 30 to 40% of the active members in his Utah, you know, South Salt Lake County, Northern Utah County kind of ward and stake 30 to 40% don't believe anymore, but they still attend. Part of that is maybe because they're benefiting. Part of it is because they're terrified to leave. And you just, you know, you just so beautifully, you know, express that. It's It seems so funny to me now that this church is is kind of about this this list that they give you. And it's a very safe space to live in to have just a just a very simple list of this. If you live this way, if you're able to answer their temple recommend interview questions, if you if you don't show your shoulders and you don't get a second piercing and you don't get any tattoos and you, you just do this, this, and this, and you do your calling and come to church and go to the temple. You do these things, that equals righteousness. I mean, that is what is ingrained in you. That is, that is what goodness is. Um, and so we equate the two, and we just say that is what it is. And so if somebody pulls back and says, the things that these this, the brethren have said, this list isn't isn't coming from a good source. And it doesn't mean those things aren't good or bad, but moving forward, like we have to create our own list of what it means to be a good person. And they've made it. So that feels really scary. That feels really scary when you've lived your whole life being told, if you do this, you're in, like you're fine. It doesn't matter if your addictions fall within the word of wisdom, like <laughs> you're good. Because if you can answer these right questions, it's fine. And, and I just, I mean, we talk sometimes in the church about getting complacent in those things, but it does feel really scary to have to decide what it means for ourselves to be a good person, like what it actually means to be Christ-like since we choose to believe in Christ, choose to use Christ stories to teach our kids. Not a lot has changed even going through this when it comes to us and our kids and our family. The most important things have stayed the same in the sense that we want good relationships, relationships with our children. We want to be good parents. And as we've evolved over the last six months in finding this new information, we found out that the church was actively going to work against what our morals are as a family, what our intentions are as parents. And I don't, that leaves us in a place where we have to find out how to move forward from this. And that, that is really scary for us because it's all we know. It is really scary. But then at the same time, I would tell people who are questioning or feeling the same way. It's also very freeing in the sense that when I was a true believing member, I had to do these mental backflips to make things work or to explain why a brother who like a, a brother high up in the church who said something offensive, it wasn't really offensive. If you look at it, and be super charitable. I don't have to do that anymore. Like the only people I have to answer for are the five people in my little family and try and love and influence people for good wherever I can. And I think that's much more consistent with Jesus Christ's message than what the church teaches. And I just, I just invite them if they listen to try and make the church more actually Christ centered. Yeah, because you remember how Gordon B. Hinckley, when he was trying to soft pedal the one true church idea, and he was going on those media campaigns. You guys may be too young to remember this, but he would always say, "You know what we like to tell non Mormons is bring what you have that's true and good, and see if we can add a little bit to it." I mean, I think he meant it, right? Why shouldn't the church now take the posture, take what, take the good that we've given you, and if you're going to leave. See what other good you can find afterwards. Why can't they have as graceful of a, a perspective about people coming into the church? Why can't they have as gracious of a perspective about people leaving it? I hope you've enjoyed your time as a Mormon. I hope we've done our best to help you. It feels like you're ready to go try and, and, and do go on some new adventures. We hope, we hope you've enjoyed your stay. We hope you we, we've been of benefit to your lives, and we bless you 
on whatever path you end up taking. But instead, what they do right now is they're going to all, after this interview, gossip about you, tell everyone that you're dangerous, possibly excommunicate you, and then tell them, also tell their kids not to play with your kids and marginalize and demean and ostracize you. And that's what it means to be an ex-Mormon. And then they're going to talk bad about you and warn everybody, you know, about ex-Mormons just in general, that they're dark, they're loathsome, the, the light's gone out of their eyes, that they're evil. They might even say things like he was cheating or there was adultery and, and spread false rumors or there was a porn problem or whatever. Whatever they can, they have to smear and demean uh, anyone who leaves and label them as an apostate. And that needs to change. Sorry for the rant. And then the only other thing I'll say is, this is why we have helped form the Thrive Foundation. And this is why we've started thrivebeyondreligion.com as a sister nonprofit. Because people need to know that there's health and healing. We've been conditioned to believe our life's over. There's nothing to look forward to. We're lost in dark and now sad and miserable forever. The Thrive Foundation, all it means is, hey, there's healing and growth after a high demand religion. And all we want to do with, with Thrive, which is a separate nonprofit, go to thrivebeyondreligion.com. You can find friends, you can find community, you can attend workshops or, or events or retreats or whatever, just to help you realize that there's a big, beautiful, wonderful world out there, possibly better than you ever had within the church. And Thrive just wants to give you hope, give you tools, help you find friends and community to rebuild and to go live that big, beautiful life afterwards. Because the truth is, Two-thirds of all the people in the world that have ever been baptized Mormon have left the Mormon church. And a bunch of those people are way happier having left it than when they were in it. That's just the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I think it helped me, too, to learn. And I don't even remember what the stats were, but that it's a high percentage of who are considered millennials who, who leave the church. And I thought, okay, there's other people out there that can see this, and there might be there might be hope for that community. I think the hardest part is just dealing with your own, your own mind that's telling you, you can't, you can't go. Thanks, Brad Wilcox. <laughs> well, and I like, think, I think just kind of the last thing I'd say is the narrative, like you said, John, the narrative the church teaches about apostates, apostates is just so unhealthy and wrong. And, like we're leaving because of our personal convictions and principle. Like my integrity doesn't allow me to stay. So the idea that people will think I'm lazy or was looking to sin or change my life, it's just not true. I, I mean, I don't know how to say it any simpler than that. We have the same values that we've always had. And in some ways we're going to hold them even stronger because now we don't have to do mental gymnastics to make them bend to some organization and that's all I would say is stop teaching the narrative about people who leave the church that there that there that there aren't legitimate reasons to leave the church. There are a host of legitimate reasons to church and I to leave the church. And I truly feel like we've been led out of the church. Jen. I've just been listening and you guys are amazing. Um but one of the things that um, when you say like, Cami, like these words keep coming into your mind, you know, the things that you've been taught, you know, and I feel you, <laughs> you know, but something that someone said to me once was, um, you know, you, for me, I'd been in the church 44 years. So it's going to take a little while, you know, for those things that have been like repeated to you over and over in the church. Um, for your own voice to come through and kind of silence those a little bit, yeah. but it'll happen. And then one other thing I wanted to say really quick um, is I wanted to um, give Cami props <laughs> for when you came to her and instead of reacting or, you know, leaving, which a lot of people do, that you loved him enough to listen and you stayed and you said, we're going to work through this together. And that I wish a lot more active members um, 
could hear. I hope that they hear that from you. I hope that they can just pause and listen. And I think that you gave such a great example of that. The information is out there. That's the thing. And I didn't know it was out there before this. But if you want to know, if you want to understand for yourself the truth claims of the church, like there are ways to do that. And it takes a lot of effort. And the barrier is huge because your mind will push you back and the people around you will say, well, you can't, you can't research in that way. Right, which it just sounds so crazy in any other circumstance, right? You would want all the Talk information. Talk about your, your bed top right. analogy. <laughs> I had told Colby before, as we were going through this, I, I just said, you know what? I have done more research on our mattress topper than I ever had on the church. I didn't know what was going on. I just, I was living the gospel the way that I knew how, the way that I was told to live it. And I could not believe, I mean, I research everything on Amazon. Don't, when you, you don't buy something on Amazon without reading all the reviews. And for someone to not know the true stories of people who have gone through this system and been affected by the things that they were taught and they learned and been affected by the doctrines of the church, I had no clue. And then to, to find out I had no clue about the actual things that I thought I had answers to just blew my mind. I, I don't, I don't think I would have ever imagined myself sitting here in this space, having to fight for happiness because I know that, that I deserve it. I deserve to raise my kids in a healthy, healthy, happy place. Yeah. I'm going to be surrounded by people who are going to tell me I can't do that without them. I won't be able to do it without these people. And that's probably the biggest thing that people have said to us when they find out that we're questioning. I think their first thought is their mind's been poisoned somehow. They, they heard something that has just taken over. And then they say, how could you do this to your kids? And I just, that just gets you right away. How could, how could I do this? How could I, now I believe, I don't know how I could put my kids back into the system. I don't think I could do it. And so I know that there are people who find ways to stay and there are people who might feel led the same way that we're led out of the church. They might feel led to stay because of a certain calling that they have and they feel like they can do good where they are. And I have no doubt that they will be guided to do what is right for them. But when it comes to us and our family, and the things that we know now, we truly feel like we cannot support this. This can't be where we put our time and our energy and our children. I, I mean, if we stay, we'd be required to, to give our son for two years to them. And that sounds crazy now, on right? Yeah, to go on a mission. That's just, it's expected of young men. Then girls have that choice. Um, Not these days. Yeah. <laughs> these days. The church is relying on women to be the missionaries because two thirds of the boys are staying home now. Yeah. Yeah. So the church needs the women missionaries anyway. I don't mean to sidetrack you. Yeah. I mean, reg <laughs> regardless, I'm just saying yeah. we could, we, we even thought for, for a little while, like we could go and then bring them home from church and make sure they weren't taught anything <laughs> off base. I mean, just Margie the crazy like thoughts. 12 or 13 years. Yeah. The crazy that. thoughts that you have where you think, <clears throat> maybe I don't have to give up my community. Maybe I don't have to give up what feels like home to me, or I don't have to ruin the family relationships that I have. And then you just kind of come to this point where you think how I can I have to, I don't, I don't think we could stay and just deprogram our kids every time we come home from church to make sure that they're not going to grow up with these certain ideas about LGBTQ people or women or women or their bodies or sexuality exactly. or people of color or people who leave the church, or other religious traditions or Christian faiths. Right. Yeah. All those people playing pretend. <laughs> According to pretend Brad church. Wilcox. Yeah, the pretend yeah. church Playing people. church. Playing church with part of piano, basically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, and it is, it's very sad. It's very sad that this is where it ends. Like it ends here where 
I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I hope that in five years we feel like we have a home somewhere else. But I know that people aren't going to stop telling me that I'm hurting my kids. And that's hard. So I guess we'll just deal with that as it comes. Do you want to say anything to end it, babe? <sighs> no, I think I would just say, I think like Cammie said, our belief in God, our belief in Christ can make space for people in Mormonism who are trying to do their, what they think is the right thing, who are informed and are trying to reduce suffering and love those around them. And I just hope that people we know that remain believers, like, we're the same Colby and Cammie we've always been. We have the same values. Those values are what let us out, and I trust in that. I I just hope that people can listen and recognize that we're not deceived. We're not fallen. We're not broken. God gave us the ability to research and read, and he gave us a conscience, and those are the things we're following. That and doesn't that, make us yeah. bad. It makes so much more sense to me now that there are so many ways to be good, to be a good person. There are so many paths to feeling, I, I don't know, to to becoming like Christ, I guess I would say, since we believe in Christ. But there's so many ways to connect with the higher power or to just find purpose in life. And, and then that's the real thing here is that, Let's not forget that all of us are just human beings who want to feel loved. Like that's, that's what it is. We just, we're all here and we want to feel loved and we want our kids to feel loved. And so we're all trying to find a way to love each other. And whether that's through believing in Jesus Christ and telling his stories or whether that's through deciding that I want to be a good person and I'm going to do it. I just, that feels so much better to me than saying there is one straight and narrow path and the path actually looks like following this list of rules that these brethren have given us. Because if you follow the rules, you can get to the temple and that means you're saved. And I just, I don't know how I believe that in that space, but I see now that that doesn't really make any sense when you think about the world as it is right now. But at the same time, I am afraid to be outside of the church. Like my, my conditioning is so strong that I am afraid of those people that wake up in the morning and drink a cup of coffee. Like, and I don't know where that comes from. I wish I could say, I just, I feel so great now. You know, I wish I could say I'm at this place where I am happy to feel this freedom. And I have had glimpses of that where I have felt like, okay, if this doesn't control my life, I get to take responsibility for that. I get to decide what being a good person looks like for me and my family. But at the same time, I have to notice that I've been affected by this my entire life. And the, the fear of being on the outside is very real. Um, and so I, I guess I have to learn how to, how to fight that battle and figure it out. All the, all the scary worldly people out there that I am now – I'm part of that, but my community is out there and, and I, I have to get rid of the us versus them mentality that I didn't even know I had. I would have never told somebody that that's how I feel about other people until I had to consider being one of those people. I didn't know I felt like that. Um, that's awful. I, I can't believe that I, I am so scared of that. Um, but I am. That's a real feeling. That's a real fear that I have to work through. And, I, and I'm and i sure anybody else who is raised in the church will experience that very intense disorientation and fear when they consider not being part of the church anymore, when they consider that they might have to go out and find their community elsewhere because this community is not safe for their family and their kids. This community is not healthy for their family and their kids. Um I just point out too that like, like you pointed to Stephen Hassan's model. I mean, I feel like Cammy got the worst of the conditioning out of the two of us. 
Um, I would just point out like you did of uh, Brad Wilcox's statement, right? That like, if you leave this church, you lose everything. That's not necessarily a selling point. Like the fact that people, the fact that my wife knows that these feelings she's feeling of feeling less than of being scared that they don't come from God, but that she still feels them like that's not healthy. That's not a healthy space. That's not to, to any believer who would watch that and go, Oh, Cammy, that's God telling you that you got to go back. It's not, it's conditioning, it's brainwashing and it's super unhealthy. Well, it's the classic trait of an abuser who tells his victims, you're nothing without me. You'll be nothing without me. Your life will be over without me. The church needs to realize that when they send that message, they're literally being abusive and following the path of abusers. Yeah, I completely right? agree with that. It's not a selling point that people, like you said, can't leave with their dignity intact. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to say, number one, you guys are beautiful and courageous, and this is going to help so many people. So that's the first thing I want to say. So thank you. Secondly, I want to say it gets better. So Cammy, especially, I've, I've been doing this 20 years. I've counseled tens of thousands of people. And odds are within a few years, take some time, you're going you're gonna to be way happier and healthier. You're going to have better friends, better marriage. You'll be a better parent. You'll have better community. You'll have a happier and a healthier life. And uh, you don't necessarily have to believe that now, but I want to put that, plant that seed of hope in you that that is the way it works. Occasionally people mess up their lives after they leave a religion, but people mess up their lives in religion. So you can't really factor that in. You just have to kind of look at the probabilities. And the probability is you guys are going to be way happier and healthier and stronger in, in just a little bit of time. So I hope you'll believe me. Yeah, if there's ever room for faith, I hope you'll have faith in that. Thank you. Um, third thing I want to say is this is why we created a podcast called The Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis. You go to mormonfaithcrisis.com. It's free. I'm not asking for any money for this. You can go through, and we've got 70 hours of free coaching, me, Margie, and Natasha, where we're just giving our best stuff out there for free to help people through a faith crisis so that it can keep you from hitting the potholes. It can help you accelerate you to the happy place. Parenting, marriage stuff, communication with believing family and friends, rebuilding a new life, rebuilding new family traditions. It's all there. So go there, check it out. I also want to say, Jen, maybe this is an okay time to plug the work you're doing with uh, number one, we at the Open Stories Foundation, with Jen's help, are now offering eight weeks of um, faith crisis support groups. So there's five across the across the I-15 corridor in Utah, but there's one online group. And you can sign up. You go to mormonstories.org slash events, and you can uh, join a support group and get support. We're also doing some... Um, retreats. We're doing one in kind of American Fork-ish area in late March. And we're doing a mixed faith marriage retreat with Julie De Azevedo hanks in June. July. In July. Yep. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so we are going, we are committed to continuing to provide the resources and support. We don't do it for the money. You know, we charge for these workshops and retreats just to pay the professionals that run them. But the workshops are free or heavily discounted. We're just doing all we can. And then don't forget Thrive Beyond Religion. Join a support community near you. Create one if there isn't one in your local area. And then find your pod. Attend these Thrive events. Get to know other post-Mormons in your area. And you'll start making some of the best friends of your life. So also, and there's a big, beautiful world out there. Join other churches. Explore Brene Brown and Oprah and, you know, um, Glennon Doyle and Eckhart Tolle, and there's so many, so much wisdom and truth out there. Go to brunch and go on a hike with your kids and improve your marriage and get some sex therapy and have a better sex life. Like there's a million happy, positive things you can do. Get a therapist, get a coach, right? Um, a big, beautiful, bright world is out there. Jed, Jed, you're a couple years out of your faith crisis, right? Um, yeah, about a year and a half. And? And filling the light. <laughs> yeah, 
the light never left. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, the light never left. Yeah. But you're feeling hopeful and feeling happy? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hopeful, happy. I think the best thing for me that's come out of my faith crisis is the ability to love at a larger scale. Um, to not to have a box of you can love this that's in fits in here. But now that that box is gone, that love that you've never felt before for other people and things, it's just amazing. And yeah, so I think that so far, just that love that I feel is just such a huge gift, huge gift. And I can see it in you guys too. So it gets better. I love that. I love it. Well, um, thanks so much again, uh, Colby and Cami Reddish. We wish you well. I hope, listen, ex-Mormon, post-Mormon community, figure out where they live in Idaho. And for those of you who live near them, shower them with love and support because they're going to need it while, they're, while their community most likely abandons them. If you guys want us to put you in touch with these groups, the Thrive groups, we will. But uh, thank you for your courage and strength and conviction and integrity and wisdom. We just can't thank you enough. Thank you, John. Thank you. And Jen, you freaking grand slammed it your first time to co-host. <laughs> Look at you. I don't know. Thank you. I know. You're, you're nice. Nice work. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this was really fun, and I, I really enjoyed being here with Cammie and Colby today I'm, and hearing their story. I'm sure I'm going to get messages and emails. Keep keep Jen on more. Jen does a good job. John, <laughs> you go away. Jen and Kara can host Mormon Stories podcast. <laughs> I doubt that. I'd be okay with that, actually. Yeah. I'd be okay with that. <laughs> But Jen, you're awesome. Welcome Thank aboard. You. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. All right. <laughs> and Kara, get better. And yes. uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com for your feedback. Feel free to comment uh, on Facebook or on YouTube or wherever it is that you consume this content. Give us positive reviews if you can on the, Mor on the Apple podcast app because we have haters bringing our ratings down who don't even listen to the podcast. You can also rate us on Spotify and on the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page. If if you want to see people like Jen and Gerardo and Kara and Jennifer and others uh, be a part of this team to make to allow us to reach more people and help more people, please join the massive wave in 2021 and 2022. Become a monthly supporter of the Open Stories Foundation. We're transparent in our finances. All of the money goes towards the mission of supporting Mormons in faith crisis and helping people heal and grow afterwards. And helping the Mormon church get more healthy by shining a spotlight on the bad stuff and uh, encouraging informed consent. So if you value this programming, please uh, support it as a, as a monthly donor, go to mormonstories.org and donate. And we'll keep doing lots of good stuff in the weeks, months, and years ahead. All right. Thanks everybody. Be good to each other. Love you. Stay tuned. Thanks again, Colby and Cami. Thanks. <laughs>